Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. I'm Andrei Shketnikov. And just recently, Steve Mould posted a video on his channel featuring a very interesting experiment. And already several people have written to us asking for this experience to reproduce it, to show that it actually works and uh, to explain it. And for the experiment, a cylinder is needed. It's best if the cylinder is transparent so we can see what's happening inside and a ball that will be thrown inside the cylinder. And the best fit is a ball from an old computer mouse. Steve throws the ball at an angle into the cylinder. It drops down, but then it turns around, spirals up and flies out. It looks like either Steve has been practicing long enough to hit the ball well, or our cylinder is too narrow. Well, basically, I need to make the throw and show it right in front of you. I think I could do it on the 10th try. Yeah, and I'm not sure about that. So, to eliminate the human factor, as young physicists say at their tournaments, we built this machine with a chute from which the ball is released. And the ball flies out of the cylinder. And I place it in again and it flies out once more. And here the ball flies into the tube. The motion is now slowed down 16 times. It makes a turn and uh, flies out of the tube. And now we will repeat this movement and trace it so you can see the trajectory that the ball described inside the tube. Here's the loop and the complete rotation with the exit. And here's what the ball's movement looks like from above. The rotation and the exit outside. And now, after the phenomenon has been reproduced, we need to move on to its qualitative explanation. But first, we need to go through one more procedure, highlight the significant factors and eliminate the insignificant ones for this explanation. So here's the first significant factor. The ball from the mouse has good grip on the surface. Can't, well, in order to, to demonstrate this, I have a few other balls prepared. This one is rubber, but quite smooth. I launch it and it goes inside. Ken's. The ping pong ball also went in there. Here's a small plastic one. Also went down. You can see that it didn't even rotate inside. And now here's this ball from the mouse. And it was the only one that flew out. So the grip is indeed significant. And we can consider in the model that the ball rolls along the wall, cans, without slipping. Although, of course, there is a little bit of slipping. Point two. Since I'm launching the ball from a pretty high height, we can assume that here, while it's moving inside the can, its speed doesn't really change. So in this sense, first of all, we can ignore all energy losses due to friction. And secondly, we can consider that its change in energy due to changes in height is also not significant. Well, in this sense, we can assume that gravity doesn't act at all. And now we will conduct an experiment that will show this side of the matter. And for this purpose, I set the cylinder horizontally so that the ball rolls down the slope and continues moving along the tangent. But first, let's release the wrong balls. This one is rubber. And, he, and as you can see, it stayed inside the can. Now here's this plastic one. And it just flew out to the other side. And now our main experiment has arrived. I'm taking a ball from a mouse. And it flies out from the same side it entered. And now the same thing, but in slow motion. Here the ball rolls down the chute, hits, then gets caught and earth rolls along the cylinder, back and forth, and there it goes, flying out from the same side it entered. And now it's time to move on to explaining the phenomenon. And in some points, I will follow Steve. I really like his explanation. And I'll add a little of my own. Well, I have to say that here we have to stick to a qualitative explanation, because the mathematical theory presented in the articles is, of course, too complex for our video. Here's a link to the article. It's located below the video. 
You can check it out to, so to speak, verify the level of the mathematics used to describe such movement. And I'll start with a simple limiting case, when a ball flies into the cylinder tangentially, with absolutely no friction against the walls. But it's clear that since there are no forces that could stop it in that direction, it will continue to move along the cylinder in a spiral. And it doesn't matter whether the cylinder is positioned vertically or horizontally. And we saw this uh, precisely with the example of this plastic ball. The friction, which had very little friction with the walls of the cylinder. And then Steve suggests that we make this assumption and he uses it there. This is the English word millet itself. And to imagine such an imaginary ball, which has a moment of inertia, much greater than the product of its mass and the square of its radius. That is such a ball during the movement of which practically all the energy when rolling, there would be rotational kinetic energy, while the translational kinetic energy would be negligible compared to this energy. And such a ball will maintain its direction of rotation, its axis of rotation as it was, when it got caught on the wall here will remain the same. Well, uh, this means that down here the ball will roll along the wall and then roll up. Well, actually, if our pipe had grown during this time, it would have moved here in an elliptical orbit along such a cross section of the cylinder. And our real Sharik has a moment of inertia of two fifths of the square of MP, and its movement uh, is no longer along such a second ellipse, but along some curve which we observed in the experiment. And of course, it's cool when there's such a big jar like the one Steve showed us, so you can throw the ball to catch it somewhere in the center of the jar. And then it moved along the trajectory, going down, going up, and not flying out of the jar. And in the end, and with the narrow jar, I managed to do it without a groove once out of a hundred. And look, I feel like I've explained almost everything, but I still have some doubts. Well, what kind of doubts? But how do you explain what forces oh, are at play? The ball, after all. What forces make Sharik? So, how does it move up the tube and jump out of it? Our ball has a finite moment of inertia. There's no such thing as an infinite moment of inertia. There, everything was clear. And here, you know, by the way, we also asked, but they didn't say anything. We were just looking at how it rolls. The ball in the tube. As for the forces, well, well, it's clear that we need to say here that these are reaction forces. We have no other forces acting on the ball from the tube. There are simply none. Yes, of course. So it turns out that the ball somehow, when it's rolling in the tube, the reaction forces arise just enough to ensure... To ensure what? Well, so that it doesn't fall through. Through the walls of the tube, sure. But that's trivial. Ah, so that there isn't any slipping. And also so that there isn't any slipping. So that there isn't any slipping at all, not like that. So that it always has the right grip. This is a perspective from theoretical mechanics. We must first describe what conditions we have. Grip. Actually, the connections. And then from these connections, we can extract the forces that ensure such movement. Am I right? Yes, of course. The forces, the reaction. They're called that O because they are the forces that provide the necessary movement. It looks like this. When we spin a stone on a rope, we first calculate, given the speed of the stone and the radius, what the acceleration will be. Well, then we say acceleration multiplied by mass will give us the force. And that exact force should be in the rope. Yes, it should be tensioned with that kind of force. Of course, it stretches, or... Well, because the rope stretches a little bit, in general, and forces appear in it according to Hooke's law, all that. But in theoretical mechanics, we don't even talk about that. We just describe the reactions. And in school too, I should note. Well, in school, this sometimes creates such a mess in people's heads. I know that our viewers keep asking us this question. Well then, let's get back to it. All right, so it turns out that since the moment of inertia, after all, a finite ball in motion rolls in such a way that its axis is also changing direction. 
And for the axis to change direction, there needs to be some kind of moment of forces that makes this axis precess. Well, how can a moment of forces arise if all this friction is concentrated at a single point? Well, yes, then it seems that the moment of forces would be equal to zero. Or infinite forces with zero leverage? Yes. But we need to remember that this is just a theoretical model, which is convenient. But, generally speaking, the ball is not like that at all. The ball we have is rubberized, and this rubber obviously touches the wall of the cylinder, not at a point, but over a whole area. Here we have a little spot, and it's trying to slip. And at the same time, corresponding reactions arise that prevent it from slipping, and those are what rotate the axis. And just like that, we have some kind of motion, which we describe with this complex kinematics uh, and this motion, causes the corresponding reaction forces. The vertical ones work, which stop it and then push it up, right? Uh, well, it turns out so. Cool. It seems like at least something is becoming clear. Exactly. Well, at least if not with math, you understand on a qualitative level where to look. Well, yes, but the mathematical equation gives us a clear description. But without a qualitative understanding, it seems incomplete. Well, and it raises distrust in many. And now it's time for our traditional final question, and it will be like this. When we launched it into the horizontal tube, the ball is rubber, but with such a smooth surface, it initially, as we can see, rotated inside the tube and moved back and forth. And then this longitudinal motion disappeared, and, and the ball, it just rolled inside the tube in a circle. Well, the question arises, what actually happened? Why did the longitudinal motion disappear? If you have any thoughts on this, please share them in the comments for this video on YouTube.